What's going on, y'all? How you doing? Hey, I'm Pastor Corey with the Movement Church Homestead, and so excited that you can join us today on our live stream. I'm actually streaming live from our new location, so it's a little bare right now, uh, but so grateful for us to have this opportunity, uh, and so grateful that uh, I get to actually preach with my family in the room, so, so they get to watch me uh, do this and to share with you guys. So I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Hey, we're going to be uh, reading from the book of Matthew chapter 7, right? And then so we're walking through Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 7 through 28. So just rock with us and ride with us uh, as we go on this journey to talk through fruit that's fit for a king. Uh, the fruit and, and, and the, the ability we have to be able to ask God to be a blessing to us. So I'm going to pray and we're going to jump right in. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your amazing love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Father God, that this situation, uh, this pandemic uh, that is taking place all over the world does not catch you off guard. You're still mighty. You're still in control. You're still sovereign, and you're still faithful. So Holy Spirit, be with us this morning. Use me this morning to communicate your truth to your people. Thank you for the invention of the internet. Thank you for what it means for the furthering of the gospel and it going out all over the world. Use this time to bless your people. Have your way in me. I pray all of you, none of me. Hide me behind your cross. I'm broken. I'm fallible, Father God. I'm not perfect at all, but you are. Flow through me. Take this broken vessel. Take this, this out-of-tune instrument and play me in your tune so your people may be blessed. Thank you for this time and thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's jump right in. Matthew chapter 7, uh, 7 through 28, and it's talking about, so I want to read just those first starting verses. Verse 7 says this. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, excuse me, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those that ask him? So we're coming to the end of what is commonly called the Sermon on the Mount, right? And so when Jesus is talking, he says, ask and it will be given unto you. It's an idea of continuing in prayer, that prayer is in view when he's saying that. And prayer is how we communicate our needs and desires to God. It's how we get to communicate with him. Of course, all right, God being uh, omniscient, right, he being all over the place, he knows, right, that what we need before we even ask him. He's aware of what we need before we even ask him, right? God has chosen to bring about prayer as a circumstances, right? It alleviates our concerns for it changes our circumstances, right? But here's something I struggle with as a pastor, right? I'm, just as I'm about to do now, I'm going to share a passage, and we get to gleam and learn from and, and, and see and witness God's amazing grace through his word, right? And then we get to think about how we're going to apply what we're learning to our lives, right? And so we enter time like this and we begin to pray prayers, however, that have little to do with what we just talked about. That's got little to do with what we've just really went through. And after all of this revealing gospel, we pray prayers that are humdrum, that are limited, right? Often we're just praying prayers about our own needs. The stuff that we need. And to be honest, it's significantly out of step with the gospel. That often we're praying things that aren't really connected to what we just got to talking about. I think it's a common issue in our churches today, right? What we pray is not shaped and driven by the gospel itself, right? But it's driven or shaped by our circumstances, right? It's driven and shaped by what we're going through or what we may be dealing with at that time, right? Maybe we, we leave behind the gospel in our prayers because we forget the, the, the beauty and the privilege we have to pray in the first place. Not only should we pray 
over the good news, but we should delight in that in the fact that the good news opens the closet door to our prayers. And that's the beauty of what we see here, that God is inviting us, right? He's inviting us to pray. We're told to ask, we're told to seek, and we're told to knock. Matthew, back in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seeking God's kingdom means putting God's plan, right, before our own plan. Seeking God's kingdom means seeking God's righteousness, setting a priority on personal holiness and desiring to be sanctified. That's, that's what that means. That's what we're after. That's what we're seeking for. What we learned here is that we have an invitation, right, to, be, to relate to God. We have an invitation to be connected to God. It's an invitation to pray. It's an invitation to communicate. It's an invitation or an antidote to our worries, right? It gives us robust confidence in who, God's get, who God is and his willingness to give his people all that they need, right? God is not lost on what's going on in the world. He's not lost on the coronavirus. He knows exactly what is going on, and God wants to help us, right? Like a human parent, his generosity may not always connect or coincide with what our child wants, right? But he knows, and we should know, that whatever our father brings is good, right? As parents, we're often really saying to our kids, trust me, right? When we're saying, no, you can't have this, or no, you shouldn't have this, this is out of a place of concern for them, not of a, out of a place of just to be mean, even though our children may think so. We're concerned about who they are. Verse 7 and 8, it, it invites us not merely to accept what the Father gives, but it invites us to explore the extent of his generosity. It invites us to go further. God is not like, I mean, how many of you guys have been to Chipotle, right? And you go to Chipotle, and, and, and they, they piling on, they asking you, hey, you want black beans? Hey, you want white or brown rice, right? And they get to the meat portion, right? And they look like they put about six or seven pieces of chicken on your joint, right? You're like, dang, can, you know, can I, can I get a little more chicken? You know, you feel like, yo, Chipotle, why y'all so stingy with the chicken, right? They give you that little spoonful, and you're like, yo, what's up? Can I get a little more, Right? Or you remember being in school with the lunch lady and they only giving you these little small portions and you're like, I'm a big kid. Can I get a little more? Right? That's not what we have to do with God. God is not stingy like Chipotle. He's not going to make you pay. It's a thing. We can't live like God is stingy. We can't live like God is giving us the short end of the stick. As a pastor, I can't act like that. As believers, we can't act like that. I can't preach like that. I can't live like that. And I shouldn't pray like that. I can't pray like God is stingy. I should be praying like God is as generous as we know he is. And as giving as we know he is. And if I shouldn't do that, you shouldn't pray that way either. You should pray in a way, you should go to the Father in a way that, that, that communicates to him and to those around you that we have a generous and loving God. So we can say to him, we can understand that this is a God that won't give us a serpent when we ask him for fish. But this is a God that will love us and, and take care of us and look out for us. That very end says, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I mean, we all want good things, right? And I believe God wants to give us good things. But listen, it goes on, right? It is telling us, it's, it's encouraging us even to live in a way that we have a generous God. This is what it says. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. 
for this is the law of the prophets. He's saying, listen, not just pray in a way that you have a generous God. I need you to live in a way that you have a generous God. I need you to do to other people what you would want them to do for you, right? You know that time when you, when you know you really need something? You're hoping there's somebody that's willing to provide for you, right? And it's not like that wish place or that hope place, but it's like a place where you, you have faith and confidence, right? That God will do what he said and that we treat others that same way. That we're thinking about them in that same way. Because we understand this, hey, the gate is narrow and the way is hard, right? That leads to life and those who find it is few. We find life in Christ. We find hope in him. But listen, let me, let me, let me go down a little bit. If we get to verse 15, right? Verse 15 is, is kind of warning us, right? And what it's saying is, hey, I need you to beware of false prophets, right? It goes on to say, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ra ravaging wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their what? Fruit, right? So what we understand is this, right? That, that good fruit or fruit in general is evidence. Let me tell you how I know. Because fruit trees never lie, right? You will never find a lying fruit tree. It's going to always tell you the truth. Fruit is one of God's favorite metaphors for describing what our lives organically produce based on what our hearts believe and love, right? That ultimately fruit never lies and fruit is evidence of what's in our heart and what we love most. It's evident of what we care about, right? This particular metaphor is re repeated throughout the Bible. And so I think about when you go to the store, right? And so you're looking for good fruit, right? You're looking for the best fruit. What do you want to do? You're first looking. You want to see it, right? You want to see if it looks good to the eye. But you don't stop there, right? You want to touch. You start feeling on fruit, right? Right? You start touching on the fruit in the store, squeezing it, shaking it a little bit. You're trying to see, especially for tomatoes, right? I don't like real soft tomatoes, right? I don't want to soup them hard. I want something kind of in the middle, right? You do the same thing with tangerines. You do the same thing with uh, mangoes, avocados. You're testing it. And then lastly, the, 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 the real test is you taste it, right? You want to taste and see if it's good. The word says taste and see that the Lord is good. So you don't end there with just seeing it and touching it. You want to taste it, right? Listen, this is a simple assessment process. We recognize who's true and who's false by their fruits. We understand and will know, right, what they do and what they don't, what they say and what they don't say. Listen, a thorn bush can insist it's a vine, but if it bears no grapes, then we know differently. A diseased tree might insist it's healthy, but if the fruit is diseased, we know differently. Out of the abundance, the word tells us, the heart, the mouth speaks and the behaviors behave, right? We can lie with our lips about what we love, but fruit trees never lie, right? We can say what we love. We can say who we love. But listen, our actions will tell the truth. Our fruits will show forth the truth. 
So in my mind, I start thinking, I'm wrestling, and maybe you're thinking the same thing. Pastor Corey, how do you bear good fruit? Like what happens? What needs to happen? Well, Jesus tells us clearly what we must do to bear good fruit. He says this, abide in me and I in you. He says, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it's in, it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. So the number one way is staying connected, staying connected to the vine. That God wants us to stay connected to him. John 15, 4 and 5 says this. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is telling us staying connected to the vine is how we bear much fruit. It's how our fruit comes together. Any branch must stay firmly attached to the trunk to stay alive. Listen, I, I, I'm, I've never farmed, right? I don't have a green thumb, but I know enough to know if a branch is on the ground, it's dead. Why? Because it's no longer connected to its power source, right? If a fruit falls from the tree, it's done growing. There will be no more growing for that fruit. If it falls from the tree bad, it's going to remain bad, right? So, so it's not going to grow anymore. As disciples of Christ, we must stay firmly connected to him to remain spiritually productive, right? As believers, we all want to be spiritually productive, but the only way we stay there is connected to the vine. A branch draws its strength, it, it draws its nourishment, it draws its protection, it draws its energy from the vine. If it is broken off, it quickly dies and becomes what? Unfruitful. There is no fruit in, in, in the dead, right? When we neglect our spiritual life or we ignore the word of God or we skimp on our prayer time or we would hold areas of our lives from the scrutiny of the Holy Spirit, Right? We're like a branch broken off from the vine. Our lives become fruitless. We need daily surrender. We need daily communication. We need daily connectivity. Right? And not just daily. We need hourly. Right? We need repentance and connection with the Holy Spirit to in order to walk in line with the Spirit. That way, we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we need to stay connected to the vine. But I know we think, it, I mean, how much, how much time does it take, right, to get a harvest, right, to get good fruit? I talked to a friend who grows guava. He said, man, it takes at least six months, right, for the guava to grow, right, for you to have consistent fruit over time is what confirms the species of the tree right? You need some consistency. You need time. And in that time, that's how you know what type of tree you're looking at. It takes some time. Jesus says that the fruit is evidence, right? As we go through this, we see that it's the fruit that shows us what we're looking at. It's the fruit that helps us understand, right? But here's the thing. The tricky part is that Good trees sometimes act sinfully and bear bad fruit, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean a good tree that bears bad fruit is a bad tree. And why is that? Because we, we, when we, we are confronted, right, if we're confronted with our sinfulness, right, and we bear fruit that, that leads to repentance, then that helps us understand we're not looking at a bad tree, we're actually looking at a good tree because repentance is good fruit. When we're approached with our ugliness, when we're approached with our sinfulness, when it comes face to face with us and we're willing to admit, man, I'm broken, I blew this, and willing to repent of that, right? Then we understand the bad fruit proved to be an anomaly in a long-term context of bearing good fruit. It just, it was just an anomaly, right? So what we're understanding is it takes 
time. Right? It takes time for us to see and understand this good fruit. Right? This is what I want you to get. This is what I want you to understand. We see this underlying truth that fruit trees don't lie. Right? There will be many that will declare, right? Many that will claim to have known God. And the response to those many will be, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Right? Think about that for a moment. Are you traveling towards hell in church clothes? Are you one of those? Look, it, it says it's right here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you to part from me, you workers of lawlessness. Listen, God is calling us not just to know, right? Jesus calls out the one who says, I know, right? And because I know I'm saved. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That is not enough to know. It's also not enough to show, right? Jesus shows, right? He, he shows the inadequacy of mere emotionalism, showing, right? We're putting forth our passion, right? That person that says, because I can feel it, I'm saved, right? And Jesus addresses them too. He says, listen, you got to see some emotion in Lord, Lord. He calls them twice, right? That even that person that shows, that's not enough. But he also goes down and he talks about the person that cares. And y'all know where I get this from. Ice Cube, right? It's talking to Trey at the end of the movie Boys in the Hood. And he's saying either they don't know or they don't show or they don't care what's going on in the hood. And Jesus is saying even those that don't care, right? Meaning I have done great things in your name, Lord. That means I'm saved. And we're understanding that even on that day, they took action in the name of Jesus. They were used of God. Surely they must be his. And still they heard, along with those who outwardly hated God, I never knew you. Depart from me. What God is calling us to is a fruitful life. That we're not just, call, uh, we're not just saying that fruit is evident because we've done some things, or because we know some things, or because we can show some emotion. That the fruitfulness in our lives, our lives are based on the actual fruit that bears to. In essence, he's saying, listen, all those that did those things, those people that, that showed, those people that knew, those people that, that cared, so to speak, were, were not people who did things according to my will. But in essence, God is saying to us, listen, it's not by your power and your might but it's actually by my spirit. That in essence, he's calling us to be, to be situated, to be, to be stable on the rock. Verse 24 says this, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. This is what I want you to understand, right? What is missing from this person? What is missing from that person that he told to depart from me? They were not doers of God's word. Instead of doing God's will, they amounted to workers of lawlessness. They called him Lord, Lord, but failed to do what he told them to do. There are moments that we can do good things. Your mom can say, hey, son, I need you to take out the garbage. And then she come back an hour later and say, hey, son, why didn't you take out the garbage? And you can say, well, mom, I mopped the floor. 
Or, Mom, I cleaned you to ro- my room. And she can say, but what did I ask you to do? Right? Everyone who hears these words of mine and do not do them, right? They're like a foolish man, right? They thought, they felt, they acted at times like saints. They even maybe looked like saints at times. But their, their lives were marked by self and sin. Listen to this. God is calling us to do his will. To truly receive the word of God is to be intentional, right? Though, though things may be tough, may be trying for us, God is calling us to be obedient even in hard and trying moments, right? That we can find joy in a crucified and resurrected Lord and Savior. A Lord and Savior that's active. A Lord and Savior that is concerned about us. And he's calling us to obey. Consider this. If exposure to God's word through the spoken gospel, right, and the written scriptures doesn't soon change your behavior, even if it's slow, slower than you might hope. If the transformation of your inner person does not extend to your outer life, meaning fruit, you may have a bad tree. Faith is revealed by fruit. No fruit, no faith. Bad fruit, bad tree. God sees faith in the heart but we can see only the fruit of faith. God can see faith in the heart, but we can only see the fruit of faith. That's why Jesus says, you will recognize them by their fruit. Yes, saving faith requires that we know doctrine, that we understand God's word, that we know his word. It requires that we show we must love the Lord thy God with all our hearts, soul, mind, and strength. And that we care. We need passion for the works of God. But it also calls for private fruits of a holy life to be confirmed through PDA. And what what do I mean by PDA? Public displays of affection. When we love God, it will be publicly displayed in our lives. Right? And that public display produces men and women and children who in union with Christ, are given a new heart and they happily do the will of God with a new childlike aim to please him. That's our goal. That's our only mandate is to please God. An audience of one, we want to please him. We want to live a life that honors him. We want to bear fruit We want to show public displays of of affection that says we love God. I believe that's what he's calling us to right now. I believe that's what he's calling us to in such a crazy time as now. It's to put on display healthiness in our lives, to put on display a healthy family. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about people that love God and it is shown forth in their lives. We're not going to be perfect. But in a time like this, this world needs to see genuine, authentic believers. People that truly care, people that truly love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it needs to see a church family on mission Movement church, I'm calling you to mobilize. I'm calling you not to shy away, not to hide. Not to just stuck in the crib, but to reach out to others. To pray for people. Call people on the phone. Seek out those that may need some help. When you're at the store, grab an extra pack of water. Grab an extra thing of tissue to take to someone. Let's be on mission. Let's show PDA. Listen, my wife don't really like PDA, right? She's not a fan of PDA. 
The, the most she wants is me holding her hand. Maybe outside of that, she about done. You be like, hold on, baby. Let's, let's get home with all this, right? God loves public displays of affection. He loves us to show forth our love for him in public. And how do we do that? By bearing good fruit and fruit that remains so that we not stand before him and he say to us, depart from me. I never knew you. Workers of lawlessness. Let's be workers of goodness. Let's be workers of joy and gladness. Let's be a healthy church put on display for this community to see in such a time as this. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the beauty of your word. And thank you for what we understand here in this passage, that we're called to bear good fruit, not in our own might, not in our own power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. That if there's things in our lives that we need to bring in line, if there's repentance that needs to happen, that, Father God, we will be certain to bring those things to the foot of the cross, to repent of our sinfulness and our brokenness, and ask that you would rule and reign in our lives in such a way that those around us may see those public displays of affection, that we love you, that we're called according to your purpose, and that we want nothing more than to please you. Be with us throughout this week. Be with us in our discussion time as we think through and talk through what it looks like to be believers in the world. And how do we p- apply this truth to our lives? And that as we pray, we pray gospel-inspired prayers, prayers towards living out who you've called us to be. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Listen, family, you can still give online. Even though we can't gather all together in one place, we can still go online and give. We'll be sure to put that up on this um, live streaming afterwards, and you'll have an opportunity to get whatever you need uh, to be able to sow into the work that's happening, to sow into the work that we want to do in this community, to serve those that are, are less fortunate in this time, those that may not be working, those that may have some other things, some unfortunate circumstances. We want to be God's hands and feet in this community. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Hey, and as we say, church is not like family. It is family. God bless you guys. Peace.